Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first SSP webinar of 2019. You are joining us for the discussion titled From Diversity to Inclusion and Equity. I'm Jeff Lang with the American Chemical Society, the chair of the SSP webinars working group, and we're pleased that you could join us today. In a moment, we'll get started and hear from our moderator and panelists. You'll be seeing the SSP splash screen as we get started in this session. Your phones will be muted automatically in consideration of our presenters and your fellow webinar participants. Please use the questions feature to send in your questions or if you need to let us know that you're having technical difficulties. The moderator will review the questions and present them to the panelists. To help her, please specify to which panelists you're directing your question. And also, please send in your questions as we go. They will be addressed after the presentations. At the conclusion of today's session, you'll receive a webinar evaluation via email. We encourage you to provide feedback so that we can continually improve the SSP webinar program. You will also receive a link via email to the recorded broadcast of this webinar. Our moderator today is Susan Spilka, one of the co-founders of the Workplace Equity Project. Susan conducted the Workplace Equity Survey last year to establish a baseline of data about diversity and inclusion in scholarly publishing workplaces. Susan led internal and external communications at Wiley for two decades during a period of tremendous company and industry change. She played a key role in the development of its widely admired global culture. Susan now provides strategic communications, public relations, business development, and research services for scholarly publishers and technology services. Susan has played a role in many pioneering initiatives, promoting Knowledge Unlatched to North American libraries, helping to build Chorus and its communications and marketing director, and contributing to programs such as CrossRep, Research for Life, and Patient Informed. Susan began her career in government at the Metropolitan Transportation Authority and the NYC Council President's Office. She received her BA from Reed College and certification in digital media marketing from NYU. Now I'll turn over the webinar to Susan so that she can introduce the panel and get us started. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. I'm just putting my slides on. Okay, thank you, Jeff, for your gracious introduction. I'm very excited to be moderating this webinar. I spent 25 years at Wiley Chorus Knowledge Unlatched and as a consultant. That experience has sensitized me to the disequity in our workplaces and boardrooms. In 2017, I decided to do something about it. A couple of colleagues and I launched a survey. I'll tell you more about that in a bit. But first, let me introduce our topic for today and our distinguished panelists, Amy Deal and Jessica Gadamu. Our focus is on how to move publishing organizations beyond good intentions to realize truly inclusive workplaces. We hope you'll come away with some practical ideas and resources that you can bring back to your companies. Um, I think my slide is not, there it is, okay. First on is Amy Deal, who I learned about on Twitter when I was doing research for my survey. Amy is the Associate Vice President and Chief Information Technology Officer at Shippensburg University of Pennsylvania. In addition to her day job, she is also a researcher whose work has been published in peer-reviewed journals and reference books. Amy has a PhD in administration and leadership, and her dissertation focused on how female leaders in higher education deal with adversity. Since then, her research has looked at gender barriers in a variety of in industries. She frequently speaks at conferences on workplace challenges and was honored by the International Leadership Organization with an award for her outstanding scholarship. Today, she's going to talk about subtle bias toward women at work, what it is and how it can be eliminated. Our second panelist, Jessica Gadamu, has been the Global Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Springer Nature for a year. She's going to talk about their DNI roadmap and the governance infrastructure she's been developing with the company's leadership. She'll explain how she's setting it in motion with buy-in and participation from all organizational levels. Jessica brings a broad perspective to the table with master's degrees in both international business and gender and diversity competence. Having spent a decade working on these issues in multiple industries, 
Jessica has experience, expertise in the design and implementation of programs and strategies to foster diversity, equity, and inclusion. Before we meet Amy and Jessica, let's take a second to set the scene. Think back a year ago, how many of you thought we were at a tipping point in our fight for equity and against bias? I did. Yet when I look at the 2019 McKinsey survey data that was just released and compare it to that of a year ago, my heart sinks. McKinsey's massive longitudinal study looks at the state of women in US workplaces. Sadly, not only does it show a lack of progress, but it demonstrates some backsliding. In 2018, 56% of the respondents said their employees prioritized diversity. In 2019, only 45% reported that their employers did. Ugh. Truth be told, I am not surprised, as it's not hard to pick up on the backlash and culture wars raging these days. The news is not all bad, though. Call me an optimist, but in our industry, things are more encouraging. There are signs of progress. For starters, I can think of three women named as CEOs of major publishing houses this year. There's Vicki Williams at Emerald, Allison Mudded at PLOS, and just this month, Kumsal Bayazit at Elsevier. All three are committed DNI activists and ambassadors. That is progress. Soon, we'll learn the results of the second gender pay gap submissions in the UK. I'm hoping for some good news. It's important to recognize that there are a lot of ways to measure progress, and seeing the needle move in some of them confirms that our efforts are not in vain. For instance, a few years ago, Alice Meadow Meadows and Lauren Kane published a study looking at publishing conference speakers in 2015. At that time, nearly two thirds of all keynote speakers and panelists were men. Since then, there's been good progress in diversifying the speaker roster, a metric that reflects the industry's leadership pipeline. The WE survey looked at many other metrics. I can only touch on a couple today, but I hope you'll all take a look at the report we posted on workplaceequityproject.org. On the screen is, a, is the demographic breakdown of the respondents. Simone Taylor, Jerry Wachter, and I wanted to validate anecdotal experience and establish a baseline to measure progress. With the help of 17 industry organizations and companies and a bunch of amazing volunteers, we launched a survey on workplace experiences, practices, and opportunities from the global scholarly publishing community. 1,182 people participated. Here, I'm highlighting a question that's similar to the one from McKinsey. It's clear that our industry is more inclusive than the US norm. That said, the experience of some groups doesn't align with their employer's stated goals. There's other WE survey data not shown here that demonstrates the relative lack of training on how to improve social and cultural affinity with groups and individuals who don't fit the norms. Are our organizations walking the talk? Sadly, for many, the answer is still no. Another I, I think I lost this. Okay, here we go. Another eye-opening finding is that nearly all groups are largely blind to the challenges of others, except people of color, who apparently are more sensitive to what others experience. A side note, our survey confirmed that our industry is overwhelmingly white. We also found that inline managers have a tremendous impact, positive and negative, on workplace experience. You can work for a fantastic company, but if you have a boss who's a dinosaur, you are out of luck. On the other hand, even in companies with outdated practice policies, some good managers don't let barriers get in the way for their team members. Which leads me to our conclusion that individual and collective awareness goes a long way to curbing bias. We all need to become change agents because success will come when we change individual minds and organizational policies and culture. 
Before I hand off to Amy, I want to share these three quotes, which I won't read, but they touch on the absolute necessity for buy-in by leadership if we are to succeed. Half-hearted efforts designed to check off boxes and comply with regulations are not going to cut it anymore. We need to hold our employers accountable and begin conversations at all levels in our organizations. The Mead quote is one of my favorite truths. Persistence on the part of a few does indeed make all the difference. So let's multiply that by many. Please do take a look at the We Survey report online to read more of our findings and recommendations. Feel free to contact us via Twitter and email. Also, please check out my guest post on the Scholarly Kitchen on March 8th for International Women's Day. Now it's time to hear from Amy first and then Jessica about how companies can move from talk to action. Thank you, Susan, for that introduction, and thank you for inviting me to speak uh, today about this important topic. Um, today I'm going to discuss my research on subtle gender bias towards women at work, and uh, I'll discuss frameworks for eliminating it. Um, but first, I'd like to start with some background about myself and how I became interested in this topic. Um, I studied computer science in college, and I was subsequently hired into an entry-level university uh, IT job. Uh, you may be aware that information technology is male-dominated. Well, I did well in my role uh, through the years, and I advanced. Um, but as I rose to higher levels of responsibility, I found that my leadership was not accepted like that of the men around me. For example, I participated in many team meetings led by a former male supervisor. We'd have a decision to make and we'd discuss a topic for the length of the meeting. Often the best decision was not obvious. In those cases, at the end of the meeting, my male boss would say, okay, we're going in this direction. And the team respected both the decision and my boss for his decisive leadership. When I became responsible for the team, I attempted to lead in the same way. We had a meeting in which a decision needed to be made. I had invited everyone affected. All team members were given the opportunity to express their viewpoint. At the end of the meeting, however, we didn't have consensus. So I tried to do exactly what my male boss had done. I asserted my authority and I announced my decision so that we could move forward. What I quickly discovered was that the team respected neither me nor my decision. Sure, we moved forward, but whereas my boss had enhanced his respect with his decisiveness, I had lost points with my staff by exerting my authority. So I had spent years watching the male leaders around me. I worked hard and everyone knew that. So why was I getting a negative result from leading in the same way as the men? When I started working, no one told me that I would be perceived differently because I was a woman. I thought that if I worked hard, I would earn respect of those around me and that's all that I would need. But that wasn't the case. I was running into barriers that were invisible. I couldn't see them and others couldn't see them. And in fact, they had no names. However, today there's a name for the phenom this phenomenon, which subtle gender bias, also referred to as unconscious or implicit bias. So I've been researching uh, this bias towards women in the workplace for the past 10 years, and I'm going to share the outcome of my latest research with you today. Um, before I get into the research, I would like to acknowledge my co-researchers. Uh, they are Amber Stevenson, uh, Leanne Dubinsky, and David Wong. And I also want to explain <clears throat> the perspective from which this re research originates. Uh, I consider myself to be a feminist. However, I have found that many people, women and men, don't like to identify with that word. Uh, it's gotten broad and it's hard to know what it means. And some people assume that it means women having, having more power than men or power over men instead of women being simply equal to men. So my co-researcher, Leanne Dubinsky, had have found the same thing. So we chose to come up with a new term to explain our perspective. Uh, by equalist, we mean that all human beings, regardless of any socially defined identity category, are of equal value and deserve equal access, treatment, rights, opportunity, and freedom in all realms of society. <clears throat> so despite the fact that women are earning more educational degrees than men, they continue to be underrepresented at the top of institutional leadership hierarchies. Uh, this chart shows the share of employees by level in U.S. corporations. The only group in which the share of employees rises is white men. Uh, for every 100 men promoted to manager, only 79 women are. And white women make up 31% of entry level employees, but then that falls to only 19% of senior VP and C suite positions. And women of color are the most underrepresented group of all. While they make up 17% of entry level employees, they drop to only 4% of senior VP and C suite positions. So although there's a pipeline of educated women in the United States workforce, Something is limiting their ability to ascend to top leadership. 
Uh, although organizations have adopted policies prohibiting overt forms of sex discrimination, impediments to women's advancement may be more subtle and more elusive than deliberate discrimination. In fact, they are often built, because they are often built into ordinary institutional functioning, they are often invisible. Subtle forms of gender bias involve barriers which arise from cultural beliefs about gender as well as workplace structures, practices, and patterns of interaction that inadvertently favor men. So Leanne Dubinsky and I wanted to know just what were the barriers which contributed to subtle or unconscious gender bias for women in leadership? So we combined our face-to-face -face interview research data. I had interviewed 26 women executives in higher education, and Leanne interviewed uh, 12 women executives in faith-based faith nonprofit mission organizations. From that work, we identified 27 barriers. Uh, what is striking is that these barriers are derived from women working in two very different sectors. Uh, while higher ed is thought to be progressive and liberal, religion is quite conservative. And yet, the women's experiences with barriers were more similar than we initially guessed they would be. Um, we have published this list in the, uh, the journal Human Resources. We have developed, published this research in the Journal of um, Human Resources Development Quarterly, uh, summer 2016, if you're interested in more information on, on this research. Um, after developing this list, Leanne and I wanted to continue the research, and we wanted to see if the results would generalize to women in other sectors. So we partnered with Amber Stevenson and David Wong to develop a survey instrument. The subtle bias towards women leaders scale poses multiple choice questions corresponding to the 27 gender-based leadership barriers which were identified in the qualitative research. We've tested this scale with women in four sectors, higher education, faith-based nonprofits, healthcare, and law. So my co-researchers and I have written a journal article about this scale development and it's currently under journal review. So we're looking forward to having the scale be publicly available soon. Um, as part of the scale development, we used a tool called factor analysis. Factor analysis is very powerful because it allows you to see data in new ways. Using the factor analysis on the survey data, we were able to discover the underlying factors at the root of our original list of 27 barriers. We found six factors or gender barriers which comprise subtle gender bias. These barriers are male privilege, disproportionate constraints, insufficient support, devaluation, hostility, and acquiescence. I'm going to delve into these each a little bit more deeply. Uh, first, male privilege. Male privileged workplace cultures assume that men are the leaders and that men control the resources and set the standards for the culture. Women may gain entry into this environment, but only in ways that are not threatening to the men's privilege. Uh, for example, men may act as gatekeepers, controlling which women have access to leadership positions and the bounds of their leadership. Women, and especially women leaders in this environment, may suffer the effects of tokenism, meaning that because they are in such low numbers, they experience challenges in both having their voices heard and in gaining support for their perspectives. Informal conversations and social activities may reflect a boys' club and revolve around typical male interests, such as sports, cars, drinking, and outdoor activities, and may even include lewd and sexist jokes. Men and women working in this environment may be gender blind, meaning that they are unaware of the impact of gender in the workplace. The result is that they neither question the status quo nor work to change it. Uh, finally, an instance in which the men, men may place a woman into a top leadership position is when uh, the organization is in a crisis or a state of decline. Uh, the woman in this case would be put onto a glass cliff, which is a perilous situation in which she will be blamed or let go if she doesn't perform the miraculous. The next barrier is disproportionate constraints. Uh, women may be constrained to act in certain ways because subordinate to men and expected to play supportive roles to male power. Starting with when they are young, their career choices may be constrained by subtle messages that they are better suited for traditional female careers, like teaching, nursing, social work, administrative assistance, rather than traditional male careers, such as science, technology, and leadership. Additionally, women may face expectations to constrain their communication, both in style and content. Their communication can't be too authoritative or too tentative, and they must be cautious when uh, self-promoting. They may be interrupted in conversations, or they may have their ideas supported or acknowledged only when they are restated by a man. Uh, women may be held to unequal standards, which are higher performance expectations than their male counterparts. They may find that they must over-prepare and work twice as hard to succeed. They may also be expected to undertake emotional labor, such as being caring and nurturing, maintaining a positive demeanor, and buffering men's emotions. Uh, to ensure that women do not deviate from behavior and performance expectations, they may be subject to scrutiny. Their dress and appearance may be a focus, and their job performance may be scrutinized in ways above and beyond that of the men. 
The next barrier is insufficient support. Uh, women may lack access to social structures and networks that would support their advancement. Women may lack mentoring relationships and they may lack sponsors who could recommend them for advancement. They may face exclusion from informal networks, unofficial social events, and sometimes formal professional events, all of which are places where work relationships are built and decisions made. In addition, the organizations may hold resources needed to accomplish their job and fail to provide support when they experience discrimination or harassment. The next barrier is devaluation. Devaluation consists of attempts to make women seem less important and distract, detract from their authority. Their contributions may be devalued if they are acknowledged at all. It may be assumed that they will handle the administrative work, including office housework, and they may experience black backlash if they refuse. Devaluation is often reflected in pay, in which they earn less for men than men for similar work. They may even be told that salary inequality stems from their family situation or that of their male colleagues. In fact, many women in our research have been told that the reason that they earn less than specific male colleagues is because those men had families to, those men had families to support. Uh, they may experience diminishment in the form of put-downs, pet names, belittling, and condescending remarks. Um, some behaviors of devaluation fall into the category of benevolent sexism, which can include compliments based on stereotypes and assumptions that women lack capacity to do the, to do the job. Such compliments reaffirm notions that women should conform to standards of beauty and be kind and nurturing and fall in line below the men who are seen as their protectors in the power hierarchy. And finally, more subtly, the organization may be ambivalent about their leadership, uh, placing them into interim or job sharing roles even when they are fully qualified. The next barrier is hostility. Hostility is an active resistance to women's presence and an attempt to keep them in their place. They may face discrimination, such as being denied opportunities for challenging assignments, job-related travel, uh, or promotions. Uh, workplace harassment is another type of hostility, which includes verbal abuse, bullying, sabotage, and of course, sexual harassment. Uh, and we should note that not all harassment comes from men. Um, in order to protect themselves, some women may reinforce sexist norms against other women. Uh, this is known as female hostility, uh, which may come from upper level women or even peer and sometimes even lower level women. And finally, acquiescence. When the barriers are so prevalent, women may internalize them and adapt to the limitations. Acquiescence manifests in several ways. First, work-life conflict has been discussed as a women's issue, but is rarely discussed as a men's issue. The male normed workplace culture has been set up with the assumption that the men have someone at home, a wife, to take care of their personal and family needs. Therefore, workplaces may make little effort to recognize their employees have personal and family obligations, and each woman is left to deal with the work-life conflict as her own issue to uh, resolve. Second, women may uh, personalize and blame themselves for problems that they encounter and take responsibility for organizational problems outside of their control. And third, they may choose to not speak up about workplace sexism in order to maintain loyalty to the male the leaders, as a self-protection mechanism. Um, oh, and finally, women may limit their aspirations, deciding that they are not capable of advancement or that they are unwilling to deal with the pressures of professional advancement that the men uh, do not face. So, whew, that's a lot. Um, I will say that some places are more supportive and inclusive than others, so not every barrier is going to occur in every workplace. And then the other thing I want to say is that, you know, these barriers tend to get stronger as, as women strive to advance in leadership. Uh, I was communicating recently with a woman who works in PR, which is a heavily pink collar industry. She said, I never thought gender bias existed in my field, but once I hit a leadership role, boom. Still, it took me years to recognize, but it's kind of like a drippy faucet. You don't hear it, but once you do, it's awfully damn loud. So for our next step in our research, we tested this gender barrier model with a data set that included women in a wide variety of industries and positions. Uh, I came upon a public data set on the New York Times Facebook page, which asked women about their experiences in which gender affected their ability to do their jobs. Uh, the post went a little viral. There were more than 1,800 comments from women working in wide ranging sectors and positions. Uh, we are still analyzing this data, but I wanted to give you one example to highlight um, real experiences with subtle gender bias. Um, one woman said, I was one of three junior associates at an engineering consulting firm. All of us had recently graduated with our master's degrees from Stanford or Berkeley. However, despite our similar backgrounds, I was asked by many senior managers to speak less at meetings while my male peers were not. I was told my personality was abrasive and that I did not need to demonstrate my intelligence. I was told to bite my tongue and defer to my superiors, even when directly asked a question by the client. 
I was characterized in annual reviews of have, as having poor management skills and passed over for promotion and any type of raise, even cost of living. What was even more frustrating was that these comments were said by female managers and the company even had a women's forum presentation on the pitfalls of implicit bias. As a young woman in engineering, the stove is sleep enough, steep enough. Having to battle unfair perceptions of me being an uppity loudmouth with a flair for sticking her foot in her mouth was the cherry on top. I quit the job and moved to a different firm. This one is led by a woman, and though it's not perfect, I'm never asked to shut my mouth. And as you can tell from this example and what we've seen in our research is that one of the um, outcomes of prevalent gender bias is turnover. Uh, the women leave, they find other places of, of employment, they work for themselves or some, if they can, they even retire early. Um, and so when this happens, these workplaces are missing out on the value, talent, and perspective that the women uh, could bring. Okay, so what can we do to prevent bias and work towards gender equity? I want to introduce to you today the gender equity framework, which consists of four distinct approaches which organizational leaders can use. Uh, each of these approaches has value. Each one addresses some part of the problem and often leads to some improvement. But, spoiler alert, I'm going to suggest that the first three are incomplete. Uh, the first approach, fix the women. Fix the women defines the problem in terms of women's lack of skills and know-how to play the game. This approach encourages women to assimilate, adopt masculine behaviors, and get training in assertive leadership and decision-making. Examples are mentorship efforts to help women fit workplace norms and training to teach women how to negotiate and boost their confidence. While these solutions may help individual women succeed, they leave the system of male standards intact, and worse, they, these approaches can place the blame on the women as the source of the problem. The second approach is celebrate differences. This approach defines the problem as the lack of recognition for women's skills. The aim is to create tolerant workplaces by acknowledging differences between male and female work styles and by valuing those associated with the feminine. However, these approaches may also reinforce stereotypes and leave processes in place which produce inequality and differential diminished treatment of women and their skills. Think of the label soft skills used for collaboration, communication, teamwork, etc. These skills are essential for organizational success, yet they are often valued less than so-called hard skills. The third approach, create equal opportunity, defines the problem as stemming from differential structures of power, which yields less opportunity and fewer resources for women. The goal is to create a level playing field by reducing structural barriers. Examples are organizational policies, such as equal pay, flex time, and family leave. These solutions help with recruiting, retaining, and advancing women, and they do ease work family stress. However, they may have minimal impact on organizational culture. They may result in backlash, and they may leave work family conflict as individual women's problems. This brings me to the last approach, revised work culture, which is a conceptual leap from the other three. Revised work culture defines the problem as one that derives from social practices designed by and for white heterosexual class privileged men. These practices appear to be neutral, but they actually uphold inequality. The aim of revising work culture is to identify and revise oppressive social practices and root out gender as an axis of power. So this process is not a one-time fix. It is an iterative process, much like peeling an onion, where each layer reveals yet another to be explored and examined. We also know that people are resistant to change, and therefore changes may be difficult to sustain. However, I believe that revising work culture has the greatest potential of creating work environments where everyone, men and women, can, th can thrive. This in turn will also lead to better work outcomes for the entire organization. So I want to leave you uh, with um, a few examples of how revising work culture may, may work. Um, first, first would be to establish paid family leave, but not just the policy. Leaders must actively encourage both parents, not just the mothers, but both parents to take it. Uh, another example would be to create comfortable mother's rooms for women with lactation needs. Um, another way to change culture is to establish norms to ensure that women are not interrupted in meetings, like set a rule that interruptions in meetings will not be tolerated, and then when it happens, the facilitator should call it out. Uh, norms can also be established around wor working extra hours. For example, encourage everyone to not check email or work after hours except in cases of emergency. This would allow women and men to have good work-life balance and set an equal playing field for women who cannot work extra hours due to caretaking responsibilities. Uh, another solution is to call out diminishing treatment of women when you see it. 
And a final idea is for organizations to establish diverse governing boards and top leadership teams so that the equity culture is visible, is visible from the very top of the organization. So these are just some examples. Um, of course, there are plenty more. Um, but I want to leave you with this. You may not feel that it's in, that in your role that you have the power to make organizational change. But I encourage you to, to not assume that change isn't possible. Uh, do what you can in your own role, but also ask your bosses and organizational leaders for what you and other women need to establish equitable work an equitable workplace. And also address your concerns to legislators who are responsible for enacting laws which can eliminate workplace inequality. And with that, I want to thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, my contact information is on the slide. Um, if you do have questions, you can type them into the GoToWebinar questions section. And at this point, I'll be turning it over to Jessica, who will discuss her practical experience with diversity and inclusion initiatives at Springer Nature. So thank you, Amy and Susan. Um, my name is Jessica Gidamo, and I'm really thrilled to be part of this webinar today. Um, so I'm the Global Director for Diversity and Inclusion at Springer Nature, and I joined last year in January, so I've been with the company for a year now. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about how we started our DNI journey, um, about our DNI governance structure and um, some of the initiatives that we started and some of the other things that we're planning to drive in the future. Um, well, as I said, I joined Springer Nature in early 2018, but the company's DNI journey actually started before that. Um, it started in 2016, a year after the merger that uh, brought together Springer Science and Business Media, the Nature Publishing Group, Paul Grave Macmillan, and Macmillan Education. Um, when a a group of uh, senior leaders from different uh, locations and business areas came together to form a diversity and inclusion task force. Um, and so what they did was um, they took a look at the data that we had. They looked at where are we currently um, in terms of diversity and inclusion? Where do we need to go? Um, they identified initial focus areas um, and also started developing a number of ideas of um, what we can do to drive change in those areas. Um, they also <laughs> decided that it would need a person who drives this full time, and this is where I came in. Um, so when I joined, it was decided to actually split this diversity and inclusion task force into two different governance bodies. Um, and expand these bodies by a few more people. And this is actually how we got to the governance um, structure um, that we have today. So let me walk you through the structure and begin at the top. Um, Rachel Jacobs, who is our group general counsel and a member of the management board, is our diversity and inclusion champion on the board. Um, and in this capacity, she also leads the DNI Council, which is basically the governance body that I work with closest. Um, the DNI Council consists of six people. Um, Rachel Jacobs is one, is one of them, um, but also our, our uh, Chief Human Resources Officer, um, our VP of Talent Development and Performance, um, who I actually report into. Um, our EVP of communications and two more senior leaders from the business. And this group very actively shapes um, the direction of where we go with diversity and inclusion um, by allocating budgets and resources, but also by deciding with me um, on which DNI projects uh, to tackle and and of course, also by being very visible as senior, very senior leaders um, in the field of diversity and inclusion. And um, as I said, we work really closely. So we meet um, about every six um, weeks in a virtual meeting because um, we're in different places, um, different continents. Um, the second governance body that I work with is the DNI advisory group, and that 
consists of senior leaders um, from different regions and mostly from different business areas. Um, and so their role is to provide input and be multipliers for the topic um, in their regions, in their business areas. Um, and we speak about once a quarter when I provide updates um, on initiatives, um, I ask for support on specific projects. Um, for example, our mentoring program, so a number of members of the advisory group are also mentors. Um, we discuss ideas and thoughts that they bring in. Um, but this group is generally a bit more on off and not everyone is involved um, to the same level. So some of them I work with um, on different projects and then some mostly join the meetings. But in general, they're also visible members and help drive diversity and inclusion at Springer Nature. Um, and so having these two very senior governance bodies really helps because um, it creates buy-in at a, at a senior level and it allows us to actually multiply ideas and thoughts and initiatives into different um, business areas and different locations. So, and while this is basically the, the top-down approach, let's say, um, we also work bottom-up. And in my experience, it's also really important to do actually both. So currently, at the moment, we do this through our employee networks. Um, so um, Spring Nature Pride is our first network and kicked off um, last year in June. And we actually have three more employee networks um, in the making that will all launch in the next four months. Um, they are employee driven, um, but they work closely with me and then of course with their executive sponsors to drive change in specific um, areas or specific topics. Um, and then another, let's say project that I am um, working on this year is setting up an inclu uh, inclusion advocates net network. Uh, you can see that here on the left side. And um, these will be local groups of, of people who come together um, to drive change in their location. Uh, and it allows actually people to, to work on topics um, that are relevant to them because we see a lot, I receive a lot of emails and I'm in touch with a lot of people and I see that there's a lot of interest to actually get involved. Um, so that will help with getting people involved in our many different locations. So this structure um, has worked well for us um, in the last year, but that doesn't mean that it's static or that it won't change. Um, we might change members. Um, there is in general, um, we, we might bring in new people. Um, and basically everything what we do around diversity and inclusion is in flux and changing. And I will explain more um, about that when I go in, when I talk a bit about the initiatives that we have uh, started. So um, as I said earlier, the Diversity and Inclusion Task Force began working um, on this topic before I started at Springer Nature. And some of the things they did was look at the available data um, to determine two initial focus areas. Um, and these focus areas are the gender balance and the international representation in our global leadership positions. Because we see that in both areas, we do have a leaky pipeline, meaning that, for example, in terms of gender, we have 57% um, 50, uh, of our staff worldwide are female. But when we look at our global leadership positions, we see that is only 39% of global leaders are women. Um, and we see a, similar, a pretty similar situation in terms of international representation. So, for example, 38% um, of our staff are based in Europe, but 67% of our global leaders are European. So that means we, these are two areas where we can and want to drive change. Um, and these are two areas that we um, decided to focus on. That doesn't mean that we don't work on other dimensions of diversity. Um, we do, um, but this is basically 
um, the, the focus areas and building on the work that the task force had done, I then um, developed these five fields of action to actually drive change in our two focus areas. And these fields of actions are inclusive leadership, recruiting, talent development, metrics, um, and community building. So the first year has really been a lot about exciting colleagues um, for diversity and inclusion and starting a conversation. And um, well, starting a conversation in, in various ways. So for example, on Hive, which is our, glo our global intranet, um, but also face-to-face -face conversations. So I traveled a lot last year and did a number of what we call Spring and Nature Insight sessions. So these are like one hour talks and uh, with a Q&A and a discussion to connect with people in different locations um, like the US or Japan or Singapore or uh, the Netherlands or the UK um, to connect with people and 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 understand also what's relevant in in different areas in different um, locations. Um, so from there, um, from 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 this conversation that we've begun now. Um, we, of course, also looked into tangible measures or tangible uh, initiatives that drive change. And I'm just going to um, talk about a few of these now. So one thing we um, started um, in summer last year um, was our um, addressing unconscious bias training. And uh, well, you can kind of see me faintly there in the in the image. Um, and that's because we developed this training in-house. So um, I worked with an interface designer and we de developed the content, um, which were um, then combined with a number of videos uh, of me um, talking about unconscious bias, what can be done about it. Um, and and for one, the, the, the program was really well received um, because it was also quite uh, interactive and um, and it allowed us to start a conversation because, of course, a 35-minute online training doesn't change behavior as such. But what we wanted to do was start a conversation about diversity and inclusion and start a conversation about blind spots and how we work and what maybe keeps us from being inclusive. So um, that worked well with the training. And because it's part of our um, values and conduct training program, um, it was also a training that everybody in, in the organization did. So all it was rolled out to all of our 13,000 employees worldwide, which had the ni very nice side effect of basically introducing me to the entire company. Um, and when we rolled out the training, actually, we saw that the numbers of people who follow the diversity and inclusion page in our intranet um, really increased a lot. So that was really helpful with that. Um, another thing um, we did was develop a DNI recruiting checklist because we know that diversity doesn't just happen on its own. We have to actively um, seek and recruit candidates from a variety um, from a variety of backgrounds um, and find ways to to access diverse talent pools. Um, and to support that, we actually created this um, this recruiting checklist, which is basically a guide um, for inclusive hiring at Springer Nature. Um, it looks at how to build a diverse candidate pool, for example, by leveraging professional associations that cater to diverse candidates um, or by reaching out to different networks, organizations. Um, and it also provides suggestions for the selection process um, of the shortlist, interviewing, evaluating candidates, um, and lots of links to additional resources. And we did that, we did actually two checklists, one for hiring managers and one for um, HR uh, professionals in order to, to really kind of um, help um, design inclusive recruiting strategies. And you see a very abridged version of that. It's a, it's a three page document um, that both hiring managers and HR professionals can work with. Uh, we also launched two mentoring programs and 
these um, programs basically focus on our two focus areas, um, gender and international representation. But we didn't want to create a program that is um, only for women. So what we did instead was we created a program for parents because we know that parenthood very often is uh, what happens like what we call the rush hour of life. So the time when, when people become parents um, and at the same time actually have to build their career. So the mentoring program um, is designed to support both um, mothers and fathers during that time by matching them with a mentor and a, like a supporting program um, with a number of events and online coaching and so forth. Um, the second program focuses on international talent. So there we made sure that we included mid-level managers um, from different, uh, different places, different locations. And we were very intentional about really making sure that we have candidates from all around the world, both um, in mentees and in mentors. Um, both programs are pilots, uh, so they are now with a relatively small group of people. And we're learning a lot in the process. Um, so um, we're now looking at how to scale that in the future as well. Um, I mentioned it earlier in, in the introduction, our employee networks um, are growing and um, we have Spring and Nature Pride as our first network that we started with. Um, the networks are driven by employees and so I support them in the process and of course I work um, with our internal comms and, and together we support the network but they are really driven by employees and, and Spring and Nature Pride, our first network, is really doing a terrific job at creating lots of fantastic content. So they're doing, for example, a blog series on the intranet, which has received really, really fantastic feedback. Um, and uh, they do events and all networks basically have a structure that they're global networks and then develop local chapters. Um, our CEO, Daniel Ropas, is the sponsor of Spring and Nature Pride and also the networks that are coming up now. So our network um, for parents, um, the upcoming women's network, and the network for colleagues with disabilities will all have executive sponsors from senior management. So just a quick outlook on some of the things um, we're planning for um, this year. So we have just set um, gender targets for our global senior leadership positions um, that we will work towards for the next five years. We are going to um, expand the conversation that we started um, on unconscious bias and expand that into um, training and workshops on inclusive leadership um, that will be available to managers in different locations to really have a conversation of what does inclusive leadership mean for us and how can we become more inclusive in our day-to-day -day business. Um, we'll have more networks coming up and um, hopefully the Inclusion Advocates Network as well as a means to um, to have more grassroots and employee-driven uh, initiatives. We're looking at scaling the mentoring programs this year. Um, and importantly, we'll also move into a strategy process for diversity and inclusion, um, really looking at af like after one year of diversity and inclusion at Springer Nature, what have we learned and what do we want to reach in five years time? So we will develop our five-year um, strategy this year um, in the first half of this year to really then um, take diversity and inclusion further. So lastly, some of my lessons learned, I just wanna quickly share with you. So first lesson learned, senior leadership um, buy-in is key and Amy said that as well and that is really also my experience because it's really really important in order to um, create the momentum to actually move and change things. 
um, also, doing it well takes time and resources, and and that is uh, of course something we live, we learn, and um, and this process is never static. So, doing it well and and driving diversity and inclusion in a global company does take a lot of time, of effort, and resources, and um, and it needs readjusting all the time to see how it can be improved. The third point is. Um, think global, act local. And this is something that I really learned over this one year. We cannot look at diversity and inclusion company-wide only. Um, it means very different things in different locations. Um, and so that means that we need to approach it on a local level as well. And one of the really beautiful lessons I learned is that many people are really passionate about diversity and inclusion, at least in our company, probably in our industry. Um, and it's really worth involving them in the process. Um, I get lots of emails and of lots of people who want to get involved and I'm now still working on ways on uh, figuring out what is the best way to actually do that. So yeah, these are my lessons learned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jessica. This is uh, Susan and I am going to thank Amy as well and um, uh, we have a few questions, so I'm going to um, direct them to uh, both of each of you and um, try to get as much in as we can. Jessica, what does SNDEN stand for in the employee networks? Um, SN stands for Spring of Nature. Sorry, I should have said that, yeah. And DEN? Our oh, DEN is the um, Disabled Employee Network. That is the name that the that the disability network that is um, going to be launched soon uh, that they chose. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm going to ask you another question, and then I have one for Amy. Um, a lot of the initiatives you've mentioned, such as gender targets and inclusive leadership training, um, the more strategic uh, discussion is targeted towards senior to including senior leaders. How do you ensure that staff members who are not in senior positions are included in the discussion on diversity and inclusion? Um, well, we we do both. We we look at the pipeline. We want to build the pipeline into senior um, positions. So um, some of the initiatives like the mentoring programs, they actually target the points where we lose, like where, where, where we see that, that the leak in our leaky pipeline. But then with many of the community building um, activities that we do, like the networks, the inside sessions, um, in the future, the, the inclusion advocates networks, these are also there to actually reach um, um, employees who are not um, not as senior or not leaders in, in, in the company. And then, of course, with the workshops that are to come, we're also looking at not only senior managers, but managers across the company. So um, that will hopefully trickle down then to all levels of Spring of Nature. Great. Before, before I uh, turn to Amy, um, can you just say a bit about the role of this senior leader sponsors in the employee networks and what value they add? Mm -hmm. um, so the sponsors are, are basically a connection to senior leadership. All of our sponsors are very senior. So um, Daniel Ropas is the, the, the sponsor for Spring and Nature Pride, um, but also for the other networks, the sponsors are quite senior. And they help the network to align their strategy with company values, company strategies, but they're also uh, uh, they also help to elevate and um, elevate the, the the topic um, by being visible advocates, um, by um, helping with networks and contacts because they're usually they they're usually well connected and at a certain level of decision-making power as well. So they're basically a bridge between employees and, and senior leadership and can really help to kind of drive change there. Great, thank, thank you. Um, Amy, um, have you gone back to the study 
to study in industry a second time? And if so, have made any, have any of them made any progress in eliminating subtle bias? So in our research, we haven't gone back to industries a second time to, to um, like, you know, assess what progress they've made. But the thing I'll tell you about the, the scale that we developed is that, you know, so far there, there has not been any kind of instrument where you could even measure the level of bias within an organization. And so this is the, the really neat thing about the scale that we developed. Um, so when that scale is available, um, what can be done is that you can take the take the scale, take the survey, administer it to your employee, your female employees, um, do some kind of intervention, whether it's training, workshop, initiatives, whatever that is, and then at a later time take the, you know, re-administer the same the same scale, the same survey to see if the bias has, you know, if if we've made any improvement. Um, and the other thing about the scale is it is divided up into the different um, factors such that if you wanted to um, test for certain things like say that you wanted to test for, you know, how is my organization doing with mentoring, for example, there are like three questions dedicated to mentoring that you can use to assess, you know, your how your organization does within, you know, specific um, uh, factors uh, of the bias. Great. We'll have to make sure to let everyone uh, know about it through um, SSP uh, when you do publish the scale. So uh, yes, absolutely. Great, great. Um, one question for uh, is more general. Will this presentation be available after the webinar? It will be posted on uh, SSP website. Um, uh, Jeff, you can let us know where. Um, to attendees for a month, attendees only for a month, and then I believe it will be made uh, publicly available, open access. Um, after that, um, uh, as I said, I'm going to be uh, writing about it in the Scholarly Kitchen on March 8th, and um, uh, so that'll be another uh, summary of it. Um, are there any other questions? That was what we see on the uh, question uh, roster. If not, I will turn the floor over to Jeff to um, uh, sum up. And we're just at noon, I think, or moments before. So, Jeff? Um, I don't hear Jeff. So oh, sorry, trying to figure out the mute options here. Is that better? Yes, it is. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Jessica and Amy, for engaging in this excellent discussion. Thank you for the audience for attending and for your questions as well and your engagement. Uh, once again, please do take the time to respond to the webinar evaluation that you'll receive over email. You will also get the link to this presentation in that email. Um, but the feedback is really important to us because it helps us to continually improve our webinar program. Please also join us for the next SSP webinar. We can, but should we, launching a new product or service or not on Tuesday, March 19th. You definitely should attend that or not is part of the title and not a question of whether you should be here. With that, we are concluded for the day. Thank you all and enjoy the rest of your day.